On this episode of Weather Watch, we get the inside details of Discover AQ, a five-year-long research project. Next, we continue our countdown of the top five hurricanes since the 1990s. And finally, Mr. Weather and Haley Storm are back in the weather workshop. All this and more on this episode of Weather Watch. Welcome to Weather Watch, Millersville University's exclusive weather news program. I'm your host, Tara Minnie. Let's first start off by getting you caught up on the weather that has made headlines in the past few weeks. Here is your weather in 60 seconds. Bushfires in Australia, cyclone in India, and snow in South Dakota are all on the list for your weather in 60 seconds. Let's begin by bringing you to Australia, where drought conditions have become worse along with unseasonably high temperatures and strong winds which brought more than 100 bushfires to the country. These bushfires are raging across more than 1,000 miles in New South Wales and threaten to spread even further. Moving north to India, where Cyclone Pylene approached its coastlines on October 12th, Pylene was half the size of the country and made landfall as a Category 5 with winds howling at 155 miles per hour. Pylene was declared the strongest storm to ever make landfall in India. The storm brought heavy rains and flooding, which forced almost 1 million people to evacuate their homes and ultimately killed 43. Heading over to the United States, more than three feet of snow fell on the ground in South Dakota earlier this month. Power outages and impassable roads plagued the state. More than 25,000 people lost power in the Rapid City area. The mid-fall snowstorm dropped 19 inches, setting a new record since the previous in 1919. Leeds, South Dakota received the most snowfall at a whopping 55 inches. And that will do it for this edition of Your Weather in 60 Seconds. Research projects are important for students who plan on attending grad school to gain field experience. A select group of Millersville meteorology students had the opportunity to go to Houston, Texas for a project with NASA. WeatherWatch's Carissa Lincoln has more on Discover AQ. Once a year, Millersville's own Dr. Richard Clark takes a group of meteorology students to a set location to study the air quality across the United States for a project known as Discover AQ. This is a five-year research project that is funded by NASA and allows the students to gather information about air pollution. In the past, they have set out to different locations, including the Baltimore and Washington, D.C. area, as well as here on California. Just this past September, they set up camp in Smith Point, Texas, where they had eight sites surrounding the Houston area and utilized various instruments in order to obtain readings of the air quality. Here we will take a closer look at the equipment used as well as the experiences of the students that participated in this year's Discover AQ research. The group of students set out early in the morning and worked all day long. The purpose of their research is to better understand air pollution by gathering data that could allow for pollutants to be monitored by space. Days were usually long. We usually started around 6, 6.15 in the morning and we had the balloon up and started profiling around 7.30. And then we basically profile and collect soundings throughout the day until about 5 p.m. with usually only a break for lunch. The instruments used to gather this data included a nitrogen dioxide sond, a flux tower, a micro pulse lidar, sodar, trace gas analyzers, nephilometer, weather pack, and two tellered balloons. My favorite instrument was the LIDAR, which was an instrument that shot a green laser beam up into the air and it measured backscatter. It was really cool to be in charge of that with one other person. My favorite instrument was the tether sound, which was attached to the balloon, and it would give us atmospheric data as the balloon increased in height. My favorite instrument to use was the balloon. I th think it's really interesting how we can collect all the different chemistry data, like the different ozone and NOx data. In order to properly gather data, all of the instruments had to be used together. 
Some days, you know, one of the instruments may not have worked. And I think it was actually a really good learning experience to actually sit down and figure out what was the problem and using your problem solving skills to get it back up and working. To determine what particles were in the atmosphere, the micro pulse LIDAR was used. Measuring the amount of NO2 was done with the nitrogen dioxide sonde. Light intensity created by a luminol solution indicated the amount of nitrogen dioxide. The more intense the light, the larger the amount. Some of the results collected were trace gas data, so measurements of ozone, nitrogen oxides, carbon monoxide, and then on other projects we've previously collected sensible heat flux, latent heat flux, temperature, humidity, wind, wind direction, things like that. However, the most important instruments used were the tethered balloons. These varied in size and purpose. While the smaller balloon communicated with the airport, the second and larger balloon observed the temperature, relative humidity, pressure, nitrogen dioxide, and oxygen levels in the atmosphere. These instruments worked together with NASA's P-3B plane that was flown over each site to help observe the air pollutants. By combining our measurements and NASA's measurements, we're able to better understand the air quality in Houston, which can help us lead to our ultimate goal of understanding air quality nationwide and forecasting it from satellites. Discover AQ is a great hands-on experience in the field of research, and Millersville is fortunate enough to be able to offer this opportunity to their meteorology students. Their research will continue in Colorado sometime next summer. Reporting for Weather Watch, I'm student meteorologist Carissa Lincoln. Thanks, Carissa. Counting down with Weather Watch's Rosa Brothman, we will see what hurricane made it to our number three spot in our Weather Watch's top five. Welcome back to Weather Watch's top five. This next hurricane was responsible for the devastation across Florida and Louisiana with in total $26.5 billion in damages. At number three on our countdown, we have Hurricane Andrew. On August 16, 1992, Hurricane Andrew formed in the Atlantic Ocean. By August 23rd, he had strengthened to a Category 5 storm. The areas affected by Andrew were the Bahamas, Southern Florida, and Louisiana. That same day, Andrew slammed into the eastern Bahamas, producing high tides and tornadoes, causing $250 million in damages. Andrew's next stop was southern Florida, where he caused a widespread storm surge. Strong winds of 115 miles per hour and gusts up to 164 miles per hour were measured prior to instrumentation failing. Florida's damage was due to the high winds associated with Andrew. Throughout Florida, 63,000 homes, 2,000 buildings, 82,000 businesses, 32,900 acres of farmland, 31 schools, 59 health facilities, and 3,000 water mains were damaged or destroyed due to Andrew. After Andrew hit Florida, he moved into the Gulf of Mexico and made landfall in south central Louisiana. At landfall, the maximum sustained winds were at 115 miles per hour. Tornadoes were reported prior to Andrew's landfall. Throughout all the areas affected, 177,000 people were left homeless. 65 fatalities were a result of the devastation created by Andrew. Reporting for Weather Watch, I'm student meteorologist Rosa Brothman. Thanks, Rosa. Weather balloons are an important tool used by meteorologists to gather data such as temperature, pressure, and wind. But have you ever wondered how we stumbled across such an important and useful tool? In our segment of weather history, we explore the development of the weather balloon and how it has progressed into what we know today. Did you know that weather balloons are launched daily from almost 900 locations across the globe? With an attached radio sonde, they're used to measure temperature, pressure, and relative humidity as they ascend. The wind speed and direction can also be determined by tracking the balloon. This data is key for making accurate forecasts as well as improving storm prediction and research. But have you ever wondered how it all got started? Weather balloons first made their appearance in the 1890s, but not as we're familiar with today. These original balloons were much closer to hot air balloons in design. They would be inflated with gas and left to rise, so when the gas cooled, the balloon would deflate and descend back to Earth. The measured data then needed to be taken directly from the instrument, which proved to be difficult if the balloon drifted and fell far from the launch site. It didn't take long for the development of a better weather balloon. 
The hot air balloon style was traded for a closed rubber balloon like the ones used today. These balloons pop when they reach a high enough altitude, and the device drops with a parachute to cut down on the drift from the launch site and makes for an easier recovery. Modern balloons now have attached radio sons that transmit the data as it's collected, so recovery of the device is no longer necessary. In addition to the closed rubber balloon, other balloon types have been developed to improve research. A semi-permanent balloon can be sent to a specific height and then left to gather data over a longer period of time. Similarly, super-pressure mylar balloons are capable of reaching greater altitudes without popping and can be left there for a stretch of weeks or even months. These developments in weather balloons have benefited meteorologists throughout the years in the never-ending pursuit to better understand our atmosphere. For Weather Watch, I'm student meteorologist Melanie Reagan. Wind. A natural movement of air from a particular direction is something we all experience regularly. In this segment of Weather Workshop, Mr. Weather and Haley Storm will explore the devastation that wind causes. Hello and welcome to the Weather Workshop. I'm Mr. Weather. And I'm Haley Storm. Mr. Weather, I was just thinking, how can wind tear buildings from their foundations? That's an excellent question, Haley. How can wind be so disastrous, and what makes wind capable of so much devastation? The easiest answer is that fast-moving air causes low pressure that forces high pressure to move towards it, making buildings come closer together and therefore collapse. Mr. Weather, I'm having trouble visualizing this. Do you think we could show it through an experiment? That's exactly what I was thinking, Haley. We can do an experiment that I would like to call ping pong pressure. Here are the things we need for this experiment. First, we need modeling clay, a hair dryer, two ping pong balls, four straws, and the last thing we need is some sticky tack. Hey, let's start by making two mounds of clay and put each set of straws in both mounds. They should be perfectly upright. What's next? Now, we are going to put a small amount of sticky tack on both of the balls and then attach them to the top of the towers. Now what? Now, the best step yet, we're going to take the hair dryer, we're going to position it in between the two ping pong balls and turn it on. Look what happens. Wow, that's really cool. It really is. So what's happening to make the ping pong balls move towards each other? Well, Haley, when the fast moving air is blowing in between the two towers, it creates a low pressure. On the other side of the two towers, there's high pressure. Naturally, there's a high to low gradient that wind travels upon. When the high pressure is pushing on the two balls, the towers move closer together, moving into the low pressure region. That's pretty awesome. So, Mr. Weather, how does that apply to wind being able to be so destructive in powerful storms? Great question! According to Bernoulli's principle, an increase in airflow causes a decrease in pressure. That's what caused the two ping pong balls to move closer together. Typically, strong winds are associated with storms. So when the wind is moving fast, it creates low pressure. This allows the high pressure to move into that low pressure region rapidly which causes structures to be uprooted from their foundation. So, according to Bernoulli, the fast moving wind causes low pressure, and since the system is moving so quickly, the rapid change in pressure causes objects to lose their grounding, which leads to destruction due to the wind. Yes indeed, wind is such a powerful force in nature. Applying Bernoulli's principle, we have shown how wind can be so disastrous. Now that you know more about the wind, you'll understand how wind can be a destructive force. I hope you join us next time in the Weather Workshop. As we all know, weather is an unpredictable force and can change in mere minutes. Various factors play into how meteorologists predict the weather on a daily basis, but sometimes even they cannot explain. In our segment of Weather Mysteries, we dive into these strange occurrences. Rain clear and refreshing as it falls to the ground. One day, the people in the Kerala region of India experienced something they thought was a message from God or a sign of an alien invasion 
as blood red rain fell from the sky. Were they right? Or was it just a faux pas? Over a decade ago, India was set in shock as bright red rain poured from the skies above and covered the streets in red, leaving many to believe it was a sign of the apocalypse. People reported their clothes, shoes, and even skin being tainted with a red color. They say it was the blood of an alien which caused the change of color, but what really happened was much more factual. When the water evaporated over the Indian Ocean, some of the water molecules carried spores of lichen-forming algae into the atmosphere and along with other chemicals mixed together to make red water vapor. When it reached over the Kerala region, it all came down as blood-red droplets scaring thousands with its strange out-of-this-world appearance. Although many thought it was the sign of the apocalypse or the sacrifice of an alien, they were proven wrong with the signs of air and ocean interaction and marine biology. If you see red rain, before you blame a supernatural force, think science. Reporting for Weather Watch, I'm student meteorologist Alex Engard. That wraps up this episode of Weather Watch. Please be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at the addresses shown below. Also, check out our website at muweatherwatch.com to see a full collection of all of our episodes. On behalf of the cast and crew, I'm Tara Minnie. We'll see you next time.